headquarters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador. This is From the South and I'm Camila Escalante. We begin in Ecuador, where protests continue against austerity measures imposed by President Lenin Moreno. People have, gather, have been gathering in different areas of the capital of Quito, primarily to condemn a recent fuel price hike and they're calling for the president's resignation. Many streets in Quito are blocked by transport workers, while indigenous communities from across the country continue marching to Quito for a major nationwide strike announced for Wednesday. Across the Sierra region, roads remain closed as many cities have been left paralyzed. Classes have also been suspended for a third day. Indigenous and social organizations from other Latin American countries, including those from Argentina, have held demonstrations and have sent messages of solidarity with the people of Ecuador. Protests began last Thursday and have been met with violent repression from the national police and army. Soon after the protests began, the government declared a state of exception. Meanwhile, indigenous protesters in the south of Quito clashed with the military, who arrived there with armored vehicles to repress the demonstrations. As the authorities escalated their means of dispersing unarmed protesters by firing tear gas at the crowds, demonstrators retaliated, as seen in these images. Our correspondent, Estefania Bravo, has the details from Quito. Yes, thank you. Yeah, we are here in Quito, and yeah, we can confirm that the situation is very uncertain. We are not clear what will happen in the next coming days because protests are still underway. Um, we can see, we, we know that the indigenous organizations are coming from all over the country, and they will be meeting here in Quito because they are against the economic measures imposed by President Lenin Moreno. Various social movements, including students, are also against these measures, and our uh, protests are taking place in the center of Quito, uh, because they want to have a conversation with Lenin Moreno, and they are not in favor of these economic measures that they say will affect not only them, but all of the country. In Quito, the situation is very tense, and classes have been suspended, they were suspended on Thursday, on Friday, and they are suspended today as well. More than 500 people have been detained in these, in these protests, and we can confirm that one person is dead. That's all we have for you right now. We'll get back to you when we have more information. So back to you. Now, despite the military and police aggression, indigenous groups from across the country, led by Ecuador's umbrella indigenous organization, CONAI, will continue advancing towards Quito ahead of the planned national strike on Wednesday against the government's economic measures. Different social groups are going up against the neoliberal government of Lenin Moreno, mobilizing, uniting, and organizing as the only way to defend the interests of the Ecuadorian people. And at this time, our people, different indigenous people, are mobilizing, advancing towards the city of Quito to demand and reject these economic measures that hit the pocket of Ecuadorians. Meanwhile, Conay has, ha has also heavily rejected any acts of violence, vandalism and looting that's taking place on the sidelines of the national protests. In a statement, the indigenous umbrella organization said that they're deploying guards to ensure the safety of the demonstrators and to also identify those who are committing vandalism or other violent acts. The Pan American Highway north of Quito was one of the main roads blocked from early Monday morning. The community of San Miguel del Comun, del Comun used posts and debris to close the highway in protest against the rise in the price of fuel and other austerity measures. The indigenous mayor of Cayambe, to the north of the city of Quito, has also called for unity among all sectors to join the march to the capital. He said truck drivers in Cayambe had rejected the deal reached by their national leaders with the government and would maintain their strike. I want to ask you, comrades, to build maximum unity and prepare so that this Monday a big delegation can set off from the central square in Cayambe and go to Quito. We will accompany them on Tuesday, and on Wednesday we will take the city of Quito.
The only objective is to revoke Decree 883, which raises the price of fuel. So we need unity and we need to organize. Over the weekend, Ecuador's National Indigenous Organization declared a state of exception within their territories. In a statement, Conaí said that any military or police officer who enters indigenous land without authorization will be detained. According to reports, close to 2,000 security forces have already been detained by indigenous people. Meanwhile, a total blockage of roads have been reported in provinces with the largest percentage of indigenous populations, such as Cotopaxi, Imbabura, and Chimborazo. Still to come, protesters in Peru condemn the president's decision to dissolve the Congress. Stay with us. Welcome back. Hundreds turned out for a rally held by Argentina's left-leaning candidate Alberto Fernandez, the likely winner in this month's polls. Fernandez beat President Mauricio Macri by a landslide in the primary elections known as PASO in August. The shock result rattled Argentina's debt and currency markets, driving the peso and bonds to record lows as investors worried about the country's shift away from neoliberalism. Argentina's will to head to the polls on October 27th, or Argentinians will head to the polls on October 27th to decide on their country's future. The only message I want to leave you today is forget all our difference. Let's get together to end hunger in Argentina once and for all. Let's get this proposal out as soon as possible, because this proposal is not a campaign proposal. This is a proposal from Argentina that we can begin to realize today. We really have to be ashamed. We say we are the country that produces food for 400 million people, and we cannot feed 15 million of our own people who live in poverty. We go to neighboring Peru, where people have taken to the streets of the capital to oppose President Martin Vizcarra's recent dissolution of Congress. Protesters called Vizcarra's decision to dissolve the Congress and call for new elections a coup, while opposition lawmakers have accused the president of overstepping the bounds of the Constitution. Meanwhile, Vizcarra said his decision was, in, was within his constitutional powers and blamed lawmakers for repeatedly trying to block his anti-corruption reforms. What I don't agree with is that President Vizcarra has completely become a dictator. In other words, if they don't do what he wants, he closes it. He closes Congress. The Constitutional Court doesn't listen, I'll close it. The judicial authorities don't listen, I'll close it. Where are we living? We average citizens don't understand the laws, but we do demand a true democracy. Mexico City taxi drivers have blocked major avenues across the capital to protest ride-sharing applications like Uber and Cabify. Many tourists were stranded at the airport as taxis blocked access to Terminal 1 of the International Airport. This even though Mexico City was among the first cities in the world to regulate Uber after the ride-sharing app gained worldwide popularity. We move on to the Caribbean, where in Barbados, the retail prices of gasoline, diesel, and kerosene have decreased, effective midnight Sunday, October 6th. The price of gasoline has dropped by 16 cents per liter, while the price of diesel has decreased by one cent. Consumers will also see a reduction of four cents per liter in kerosene prices. These price adjustments are in keeping with gov the government's policy of allowing retail prices to be reflective of those on the international market. And the Prime Minister of Barbados, Mia Motley, shared her thoughts on how important sustainability is to small island states of the Caribbean that are the most vulnerable to the harsh effects of climate change. Motley was speaking at the Trade for Sustainable Development Forum in Geneva, Switzerland, where she called the saga of her where she recalled the saga of Hurricane Dorian and its devastating effects. It was category hell. For those of us who flew into the Bahamas within 48 hours of the all clear, it was absolutely patent that the destruction was unimaginable. Small states cannot continue arguing for vulnerability over and over and over for three decades and to be ignored and for us to believe that therefore that the world cares enough about us. 
The bottom line is that the opportunities for trade and economic activity are there. What is missed out with 100%? Let us claim ground where we are and let us ensure that those countries to be able to make the changes where we can in terms of renewable energy, in terms of banning coal plants, in terms of planting trees, in terms of our work with materials, not just plastics, but other materials that have the capacity to regrettably alter the world that we've come to love. At least two members of the Caribbean community, CARICOM, have reintroduced visa requirements for Haitian nationals. Barbados and Dominica have both re-implemented the travel restrictions. It does not apply to Haitian nationals who are holders of diplomatic or official passports, who are business persons, or those who are holders of US, UK, Canadian, or Schengen visas. Barbados, which al allowed visa-free movement of Haitian nationals last year, was the first to announce a reversal of the measure. This is believed to be linked to a wave of protests in Haiti due to the government's corruption, inflation, and a scarcity of fuel. Haitians are bracing for more upheaval as protesters demanding the president's removal pledged to remain on the streets this week. This as the opposition continues to put pressure on Moise to stand down. Last Friday saw mass protests in the capital, Port-au-Prince, against crippling fuel shortages, ballooning inflation, and corruption. During the demonstrations, a Molotov cocktail was thrown into the premises of the Immigration and Immigration Building. Friday's unrest came after weeks of protests in which 17 people were reportedly killed. Trinidad and Tobago's police commissioner, Gary Griffith, has responded to media reports questioning his qualifications. He says there seems to be a deliberate attempt by the media to discredit or malign him. The commissioner says he holds a master's degree in security management, but was also approached by the University of Leicester to be awarded with an honorary master's for work undertaken. Last week, the cabinet upgraded the academic criteria needed for the police commissioner job with a master's degree being the minimum requirement apart from other skill sets. And staying in Trinidad and Tobago, their finance minister, Colm Imbert, is presenting the government's fourth annual budget. However, this is overshadowed by the government's plan to subsequently debate a motion concerning the Elections and Boundaries Commission, Commission's local government draft order. The order needs to be passed to facilitate holding of government elections expected by year's end. The unusual occurrence has sparked uproar by the opposition. Imbert is expected to speak for at least three hours, following which MPs will debate the EBC order. After the break, we'll return to Ecuador to hear from our correspondent on the ground in Quito. Don't go away. Welcome back. Climate change activists affiliated with the Extinction Rebellion movement have launched fresh protests in South Africa. The activists marched in the streets of Cape Town waving banners and shouting slogans, calling for the South African government to act on climate change. Extinction Rebellion has in the past months been mobilizing protests mostly in major cities across the globe demanding governments cut carbon emissions. Now this is all about telling the truth that, and getting the government to declare a climate emergency. You know, this is serious, we can't wait any longer. The government needs to step up and act and it's about yeah, telling people, getting people to realize it's an emergency, we need, to, we need to act now. Still in South Africa, former President Jacob Zuma's son has appeared before the Judicial Commission of Inquiry into state capture. It's a type of systemic political corruption in which private interests significantly influence a state's decision-making processes to their own advantage. Duduzen Zuma denied before, an, before a state anti-corruption inquiry allegations by the former deputy finance minister that he was offered a $40 million bribe from South Africa's business family known as the Guptas. This comes after his father also appeared several times this year before the commission to answer charges of state capture. There's been a prevailing narrative up until this point about state capture, corruption, influence um, outside of government, um, appointing of ministers and whatever else. Now, 
I'd made the decision to pull back and not to be active in, in, in a lot of roles okay. uh, to my detriment. So I couldn't grow with my company. Following six days of unrest in Iraq, which has so far left over 100 dead, the Iranian government has called on citizens from the neighboring nation to show restraint. Clashes between security forces and protesters have revived fears of a new spiral of violence, which could suck in influential militia groups and be exploited by the Islamic State armed group. The Islamic Republic is making a determined effort to help build a strong, secure and free Middle East for all the countries. In this regard, we are always concerned and saddened to see insecurity and unrest in neighboring countries, and we want to see peace and stability in all the countries of the region. In this regard, the recent events in Iraq have brought sadness and caused concern for the Iranian nation and the Iranian government. In recent days, while the people of Iraq and the Iraqi government have been preparing for one of the world's major cultural religious events, and while the region has been taking steps towards peace and stability, we have witnessed bitter events taking place that have unfortunately led to loss of many lives. The government of Iraq has assured that there has not been clashes between its security forces and the protesters. The government has blamed other elements who have taken advantage of the situation and committed criminal acts. We urge the great people of Iraq to pursue their grievances and demands through legal and democratic channels. The citizens of Iraq should be mindful that while they pursue their demands, there are elements with bad intent who are ready and waiting to take advantage of the situation. U.S. troops are leaving northern, northeastern Syria. Our correspondent in Damascus, Hisham Manus, has the details. Invading U.S. troops have withdrawn from their positions of, in the north of Syria. The U.S. authorities say they have pulled back eight kilometers from the Tal Arkham base and also from control posts in this area, where Turkey is planning to begin a military operation against the Kurdish separatist fighters of the so-called Syrian Democratic Forces. Turkey calls them terrorists and says they are endangering its national security. This decision by Turkey comes after the failure of talks to create a supposed safe zone in the north of Syria. In August, Turkey and the United States did agree to set up a coordination center and they began joint patrols as a step towards creating the safe zone. But they couldn't agree on how far such a zone would extend. Turkey wanted it to reach 32 kilometers from the Turkish border. The Turkish government spokesperson has insisted that this military operation will not be directed against the territorial integrity of Syria. He said it only intends to clear the area of what he called Kurdish terrorist elements and then set up a safe zone to house Syrian refugees who are currently in Turkey. The United States has made clear that its forces will not take part in this operation and that Turkey will be responsible for the members of the Islamic State group who are currently being held by the Kurdish militias, the SDF, for its part, has said it will respond with an all-out war against Turkish forces right along the border if they launch this attack. And it has criticized the United States for failing to stand by its commitments. The Syrian government has not yet responded to all these declarations. But it has previously said that the presence of Turkish and U.S. troops on Syrian soil is illegal and a violation of Syria's sovereignty. We're now going to head back to Ecuador as we're joined by our correspondent, Ian Bruce, from the city center of Quito. Thanks so much for joining us, Quito, or for joining us, Ian. Ian, if you can hear me, can you talk? Hello, yes. We're right here at just about two blocks from the Carandale Presidential Palace. And as you can see, the entrance is blocked off all the entrances to the palace are blocked off right around the square. And there's a small group of demonstrators here at the moment. There was an incident earlier on when we're down the other side. The police used tear gas and pepper spray, spray against some protesters down below the square. And also there were some confrontations further up above the square earlier on. But right now, what people are really waiting for is the arrival of several thousand indigenous protesters who've been coming in from the south of the city. We believe they're now just a few kilometers to the south of here, heading towards the palace. So that's what these protesters are really waiting for. It's been a pretty fast moving day here. Just a few hours earlier, 
we saw in the presidential palace, in the Carandole, there was a, a lot of journalists around waiting for a news conference. Suddenly, the palace was evacuated and we saw a helicopter flying overhead. Many people thought at that point that the President Lenin Moreno had actually fled the palace. That doesn't seem to be in the case. Later, some of the police told us that Lenin Moreno hadn't actually been inside the palace, that it was the Vice President, if anybody, who was on that helicopter. We can't confirm that. But the big thing here, really, throughout the day, has been the arrival of thousands of indigenous protesters from the north and from the south in really large contingents. We saw earlier in the day a group, uh, some of the indigenous protesters on the southern outskirts of the, of the capital. They took, uh, took control of one of the armored personnel carriers that the army had been deploying here. They set fire to it and pushed it over, uh, a press over uh, an embankment. Uh, and that was just one sign of the kind of force that this protest is having against the fuel price rises and against Lenin Moreno's austerity measures. But surprisingly, shortly after that, we saw a very different kind of scene where some of the military who were meant to be blocking the protesters actually waving the indigenous protesters through, which suggests that perhaps the military itself is not entirely solid in its control of this situation. At the same time, there also is a large group of indigenous demonstrators arriving in, uh, in the north of the city. We're told as many as 50,000 possibly. They've been coming in from Kayambi, from Mimbabura, from the northern part of the, of the, of the highlands uh, of Ecuador. So there is a real sense of expectation here about exactly what is going to happen when these indigenous protesters principally team up with the other protesters who are here and get close to the presidential palace, even if the president himself is, as we believe, still in Guayaquil. Thank you so much for those important updates, Ian Bruce. We've been speaking to our correspondent, Ian Bruce, who is in the historic center of Quito, Ecuador. We're moving on to Canada now. Canada will head to elections on October 21st to elect members of parliament and the office of prime minister. Our correspondent in Toronto, Pablo Vivanco, has more ahead of tonight's leaders' debate. We're exactly two weeks away from voting in Canada's federal election and tonight will be the first debate to feature all of the candidates from the leading political parties. Now, the Conservatives led by Andrew Scheer are polling just ahead of the Justin Trudeau Liberals with the NDP and Jagmeet Singh along with the Bloc Québécois and the Green Party led by Elizabeth May trailing far behind. Now, in Canada's first past the post parliamentary system, the candidate to win the most votes in each riding gets the seat for that riding and goes to represent that district in the House of Commons. The party that wins the most seats in the 338 member House of Commons gets to form government and the leader of that party becomes Prime Minister. Now the same uh, polls that have the Conservatives ahead of the Liberals are thereby projecting that the Liberals have a high likelihood of winning a minority government. Tonight in the debate it's expected that climate change and the economy uh, will dominate the debate, although the uh, indigenous rights issues are likely to uh, also be mentioned significantly given that this past weekend, uh, something that took up much of the headlines here in Canada uh, was a decision by the Trudeau government to challenge settlements uh, for victims of the residential school system. Thank you so much, Pablo. We've come to the end of this news brief. You can find these and many other stories on our website at tellusterenglish.net. And join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Tellusterenglish, I'm Camila Scalade. Thanks for watching.